Hi everyone, welcome to this Oracle Database World On Demand session for Data Mesh, Microservices, and Trusted Golden Gate Data Events. My name is Jeff Pollock. I'm Vice President of Products here at Oracle. Um, I'm really excited to present on this topic. Uh, Data Mesh, Microservices, the new Golden Gate architectures around microservices are uh, all cutting edge uh, technologies. And uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff that we can talk about today around application development, uh, newer patterns uh, for leveraging these kinds of tools in those modern architectures and the benefits that they're going to bring you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump straight into the presentation. First up, a little bit of a background on data mesh. Uh, totally a you know hot topic in the industry right now. Um, really reanimated uh, the, the term data mesh. Uh, from a ThoughtWorks paper by Zamak Dagani back in 2019, really kicked off a whole new generation of thinking, a lot of activity in the community going on around data mesh right now. Oracle has been involved um, really since uh, nearly the beginning, picked up on the trend uh, early on, and we started doing um, public webinars in early 2020, been working with customers since uh, 2019, uh, fits well with a lot of the distributed architecture concepts that Oracle's already been uh, building towards for a number of years. A lot of good uh, technical content out there, so we won't have time today to get into every aspect of the data mesh and every aspect of the different uh, products that Oracle has that supports the data mesh. Really encourage folks that are looking for deeper dive, more content to check out the ebook, check out the technology brief, and you'll get a much broader uh, cross uh, reference of uh, all the variety of different Oracle products that touch on the data mesh concept. The data mesh itself um, really is driving kind of a fresh approach or a new approach towards working with data. And uh, first and foremost, it requires a cultural and a mindset shift towards thinking of data as a product. Um, that's really the most important thing to kind of emphasize around the data mesh areas. It's not just a technology uh, concept. It's a concept that really needs to drive cultural and behavioral and organizational changes in order to maximize the success potential. Uh, however, there also is a, a pretty significant shift towards newer tech technical paradigms as well. And so um, that includes item number two here is really uh, focusing on joining up the operational and analytic data domains together. This is really um, in an effort to make it uh, more frictionless to connect the producers of the data in an organization with the consumers of the data within the organization. A lot of emphasis around removing IT as the middleman IT, of course, can continue to support the platforms that connect producers and consumers, uh, but uh, IT as a middleman for the projects really uh, creates a lot of friction and lacks a lot of the domain expertise required around the data to make it successful anyway. The third component here is really around uh, emphasizing data in motion. And uh, the, the data in motion are moving towards these real-time data paradigms. It's really an underlying key success driver for a lot of this data fabric as well as data mesh uh, capabilities. And so it, it really enables these, these data in motion architectures truly en enable uh, the distributed, the underlying distributed architecture for on-premises and multi-cloud data resources. So Oracle's uh, role in this, the, the definition that we're bringing really emphasizes um, a couple of unique components that make this uh, Oracle take on the data mesh uh, very Oracle centric. Number one, we're really focusing on making sure that this is a trusted data mesh. We bring a lot of technologies that will emphasize the data consistency components of the data mesh, ensuring uh, strong ACID level capabilities around data and data transactions and emphasizing the reliability of data and the resources that are enabling these distributed architectures. Uh, we also emphasize that union, as I mentioned on the previous chart, between the operational and the analytic data resources. Uh, our take on this is that in order to best connect the producers with the consumers of the data resources, we need common data domains that span from the systems of record, which are also uh, typically the sources of truth for data, all the way over to the analytics side, which is typically where you have uh, more of the decision uh, making consumers uh, picking up those data resources. And so in order to make those uh, distributed and decentralized networks most effective, uh, we need to be able to connect them directly and the data mesh architecture needs to span from operations to analytics. Uh, the ways to do it very much aligned with the community thinking 
uh, in this area, we need to focus on providing data products. Uh, data products is that cultural and mindset shift, as I mentioned. Uh, we need to be able to accept and adopt and uh, drive decentralized data architectures uh, that reflect kind of modern um, uh, modern infrastructure choices that enterprises are making today. Uh, we at Oracle, we emphasize the event-driven and the streaming elements of the data mesh, and that is really what enables those data in motion architectures for enabling a decentralized approach to succeed. Um, please note that we, uh, of course, uh, believe that self-service, low-code, and data governance-driven approaches are integral uh, to success with the data mesh. It's just that these uh, three areas, self-service, low-code, and, and data governance, these are really integral to really all data architecture approaches, um, even prior to the data mesh. And so we consider these elements really table stakes in, uh, in regards to data management. And of course, they're uh, equally and very important to the data mesh architecture as well. So uh, let's take a look at these four different areas. First up is data product thinking. Data product thinking um, really is uh, kind of that, that mandatory fundamental new element that has been added into the data mesh concept. Um, it's really part of every data mesh definition that's out there. Um, the way I like to describe this is that, you know, when we think of a data product, a product is something that has been created for a specific purpose or what Clayton Christensen calls for a job to be done. This is a very active tense uh, for the notion of product. It's, it's doing something, it's fulfilling some value. Uh, whereas an asset or a data asset, um, this is a more passive representation of something that has value. Um, it can you know, maintain its value, but it might be sitting idle. Um, maybe these are resources or assets that are tended to by stewards. In the case of IT, we talk about data stewardship, for example. And so there's really this shift in mindset where we need to be begin thinking about data, not as something idle or passive that's sitting there with value to be governed, but as something that's more active, uh, something that is being built and refined and used and produced and con uh, consumed by data consumers. And so it's that active tense that carries things forward around this notion of data product thinking. Um, it really emphasizes from a design standpoint as well, uh, putting the consumption or the data consumers at the heart of the design. And this is really what Clayton Christensen wrote in The Innovator Solution as really putting the customer at the heart of the solution. And that really is the, the, uh, the answer to the innovator's dilemma is uh, to put the customer first. And that's really what we're trying to do here with this notion of data product thinking is really pull forward uh, the consumption patterns for data and then uh, build a paradigm around how that needs to be reflected in the enterprise data architecture itself. The second big component here for a decentralized uh, for a data mesh is uh, to emphasize the decentralized data architecture. So in this case, um, you know, having the word mesh in uh, the description of the architecture, this really means something. Um, the word mesh means something in, in IT. It's not a, a marketing word or a made up word to make it sound good. Um, mesh is a very specific kind of um, topology where non-hierarchical nodes work together collaboratively. And this is different than a hub type architecture uh, where centralized activities happen in the middle and then are redistributed out to the edge. And for most of the recent history, let's say 10, 15, 20 years, really these hub and spoke type architectures have dominated the data architecture paradigm. Hub and spokes for ETL processing, hub and spokes for data pipelines, hub and spokes for operational data stores, hub and spokes for uh, enterprise data warehousing, even hub-based uh, architectures for data lakes um, and, and big data architectures. And really what we're moving towards now is this paradigm that, um, that, that decentralizes or distributes uh, data. And it's really a reflection uh, more so of the reality of actually what's going on in the industry today where infrastructure is becoming more diverse. Um, monolithic architectures, even on the software development side of the house, are uh, coming out of fashion very quickly. And so when we uh, look at the reality of what we're faced with today, where modern applications are decentralized, modern software applications are decentralized in a service mesh using microservices, um, 
and uh, infrastructure is increasingly decentralized across multiple clouds, the edge, cloud at customer, on-premises environments, you know, it means that we really need to begin treating this, uh, this topology uh, more as a feature and not a bug. We need to accommodate it rather than try to reject it. Um, and so that's what the data mesh is kind of bringing to the discussion here is really this emphasis around um, supporting decentralized data architectures. The third area here is, is really getting into answering the question of how we do this, right? So in order to shift successfully and aggressively towards a decentralized architecture that's distributed, the fundamental way to do that is by adopting these event-driven data ledgers. And so ledgers, uh, also known as logs in the industry, are really the fundamental uh, key uh, to being successful in these distributed architectures. And so the, the ledgers provide those sort of running list of transactions or activities, logging events that applications, databases, business processes um, are, are doing throughout the day. And in order to uh, effectively distribute the, the data itself, we need to have that fine-grained understanding of what the events are that are happening to the data, happening within the business process, happening within the software application. And so these ledgers or these logs uh, really are the, the fundamental um, grain of information that gets distributed across the various architectures um, within, uh, within the IT uh, infrastructure. So um, when we say uh, that we're working with distributed events, that also means we need to be able to process those events in real time or near real time uh, type models. And so in this case, the word polyglot is really reflecting the fact that we just as we have different types of ledgers within the enterprise, uh, we will have different types of streams uh, for processing the events off of those ledgers. And so uh, some uh, ledgers produce events that are simpler. For example, Base64 um, events describing uh, telemetry wind up as kind of simple payloads and tools like Apache Kafka. There are other more complex protocols and complex events where you know real-time business processes are activities that might uh, occur between different ERP systems or uh, back office uh, business systems. Um, these can be defined by more complex protocols with multi-step handshakes, uh, complex payloads, uh, like uh, DTD or XSD payloads in XML. And then there's also um, uh, data event specific payloads where there's a lot of emphasis in providing strong consistency guarantees, strong isolation guarantees, what we call ACID transactions. And these uh, data events can contain, uh, you know, many, uh, many, many tuples, you know, uh, all the way from a single record all the way up to millions of records. Uh, these transactions um, can be microsecond level transactions one at a time, but they can also be several hours or in some cases several day long transactions when uh, these these events happen in bulk or in batch. And so uh, the, the enforcement of the consistency is really the, defining the boundary of those data event transactions. So being able to handle all of these different types of uh, streaming data activities is really core to uh, the, the, the data mesh concept and really enables in a lot of ways that distributed architecture. So when we talk about this as Oracle, you know, we've put together seven distinct data mesh use case examples that uh, really define those common use case solutions that our customers can apply the data mesh on both the operational as well as the analytics side. And again, that's really key here. We've included this quote from MIT um, uh, Sloan. And uh, really it's this notion that by integrating those operational uh, events that are happening on the systems of record and sources of truths in real time, with the analytics that are going on within an or or organization, the, you know, our customers can make better operational and strategic decisions. And we believe that's really key to reducing the friction across the data domains that naturally occur between the systems of record and the systems of analysis. And so uh, this is, is really integral to the, the Oracle vision behind uh, the data mesh. So you know we've got lots that we could drill down into with regards to these seven core use cases. You know, everything from application modernization data availability and continuity, event sourcing, transaction outbox, patterns for microservices, event-driven integration for systems of interoperability, streaming ingest for moving uh, transactions from the sources of truth up to the cloud, 
you know, ingesting into uh, these cloud-based architectures for data lakes and data lake houses, uh, using data mesh technologies to drive modern data pipeline technologies, and then ultimately also um, uh, being able to perform analytics on the data streams themselves while the data is flowing in motion. You know, all of these are really, really interesting use cases. Unfortunately, today we don't have time to kind of dive into every one of these uh, single use cases, but there's a lot of information uh, out there in some of the papers that I referenced at the beginning of this talk. Um, we also um, are looking to include specific details about uh, case studies uh, our customers that have successfully implemented these patterns. Again, we don't have time to go through every one of these in detail today, but uh, the ebook, uh, the Oracle ebook on data mesh includes information from you know Intuit, Netflix, Wells Fargo, PayPal, Western Digital, LinkedIn, SailGP, who've all implemented various aspects of a data mesh uh, type architecture and uh, really uh, you know, exemplify in a lot of ways uh, these different elements of, of a data mesh implementation and the, the, you know, the, the corresponding use cases that, uh, that have been built here. So for the rest of today's talk, the rest of today's presentation, we're really gonna be drilling into this one specific use case pattern around event sourcing and transaction outbox. And so if you've come to this presentation uh, without knowing or having heard of these terms before, event sourcing and transaction outbox, I think a um, little bit of background on this is that you know modern application software design is aggressively shifting over to what we call a microservices type architecture. Within the microservices type architecture, there are specific design patterns that have been uh, identified for helping developers implement uh, commonly reused solutions. And in this case, event sourcing and transaction outbox are the names of two uh, commonly referred to patterns within microservices that are uh, aiming to help developers with data tier uh, semantics or you know uh, uh, stronger solutions for working with data within those microservices architectures. And uh, we'll drill down uh, in just a moment here uh, in a little bit more depth on, on what those patterns mean and how they apply. So first, uh, a bit of background about Golden Gate. So um, uh, again, hopefully you've come to this presentation understanding a little bit about Golden Gate. Golden Gate uh, is one of the most successful, if not the most successful integration tool in the industry. Thousands of customers in 180 countries in over 80% of the global Fortune 100 consistently rated as number one for real-time data and real-time data fabric strategy. Uh, Golden Gate's been a longtime innovator in the space. It was the very first startup around change data capture and replication back in the 1990s, the first to implement a canonical uh, data event ledger, the first to support Apache Kafka as a target, the first to support cloud-based um, services with an hourly uh, meter, an hourly uh, billing metric in the cloud all the way back in 2016. Uh, what we're talking about today, as far as microservices and microservices architecture, uh, Golden Gate began to roll out um, as generally available in 2017. So the first to support a full microservices architecture, first to uh, combine and embed streaming integration with a replication tool, the first to uh, deploy and, and support a productized edge capability. And then this year we launched a fully managed elastic uh, cloud service. This is our Gen 2 uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Golden Gate capability just launched a few months back. Um, so long time tradition of innovation uh, in the industry and this topic today, microservices kind of is at the heart of that. A lot of people know Golden Gate for the data event story over here on the left hand side of this chart. They think of Golden Gate as being a replication tool, as a change data capture tool, maybe for use cases around data high availability. Uh, but Golden Gate as a platform over the last five to seven years has expanded to include all of these other areas as well. So Golden Gate as a platform covers data pipeline capabilities, streaming analytics capabilities, data governance capabilities, including data verification with Golden Gate Veridata. Um, so really now spanning all of these use cases and they're all really a core part of these real-time data fabrics, real-time data mesh uh, type architectures. So Golden Gate is um, a heterogeneous tool. Um, in fact, the, the, from the very beginning, the founding of the company Golden Gate was around um, uh, HP Tandem nonstop databases. Um, so uh, sometimes people think since Oracle Golden Gate is an Oracle product that it only supports Oracle databases, and that's just not true. So um, a huge 
uh, chunk of the global adoption around Golden Gate is in these you know, non-Oracle relational databases on the left, the non-relational um, data stores like Cassandra and Mongo on the left, um, K Kafka also as a supported source, as well as direct integration with applications. And over on the right-hand side, uh, Golden Gate can deliver to all different cloud environments, different big data and data lakehouse environments, different streaming environments, different NoSQL environments. Of course, uh, Golden Gate can deliver to all different types of databases. Remember, this is a real-time event-driven uh, type architecture. Golden Gate itself is a data event ledger uh, where we're uh, replicating uh, the, the data events across uh, different Golden Gate ledgers throughout uh, a, a wide area, you know, distance separated by hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So Golden Gate itself supports, you know, over a thousand different combinations of data stores, platforms, cloud technologies, um, et cetera. Uh, truly a whole enterprise multi-cloud solution. And so today we're talking about the microservices architectures and we will kind of be drilling down a little bit more into how Golden Gate can be used to support these design patterns of software-based microservices, but Golden Gate itself is also operated and run as a microservice or as a collection of microservices in this case. So when you run Golden Gate from the Oracle Cloud, you get the control plane from the Oracle Cloud. So the Oracle Cloud is the control plane when you operate Golden Gate from Oracle Cloud. But when you operate Golden Gate on-premises, uh, at the edge, or on other clouds, Golden Gate actually provides its own control plane. It's called the Golden Gate uh, Service Manager. Uh, that itself uh, takes care of uh, what we call our data plane services. The data plane services are the administration service, the performance metric service, the distribution service, and the receiver service. And these are the different, these uh, really encapsulate the different uh, capabilities of Golden Gate uh, itself. Admin service uh, is where you uh, create and, and run all your deployments. Um, your individual extracts and replicates. And then uh, the performance metric services where you monitor uh, those extracts and replicates. Um, the distribution services where you distribute transactions using the native uh, Golden Gate Trail Protocol and the receiver services where you would receive those and apply them uh, to a downstream uh, target. And so all of this uh, Golden Gate microservices infrastructure is 100% built out around uh, REST APIs, uh, it, it, you know, each microservice has its own built-in browser-based uh, UI, and the whole thing um, has been radically simplified so that it can run uh, in a containerized environment with Kubernetes stack on uh, OpenStack technology on any cloud. I've already mentioned it can run natively on the Oracle cloud. And it really simplifies the lifecycle and CI/CD infrastructure for managing uh, Golden Gate at scale. So, you know, a little brief uh, commercial, if you will, for our, uh, our audience here that is already running Golden Gate, I uh, strongly encourage you to cut over to these microservices, uh, Golden Gate microservices architecture now. Um, so this is the strategic direction of the product. Uh, we've already announced that the older classic architecture has been deprecated as of Golden Gate uh, 21.1. Microservices are free and included with all of the main Golden Gate products. There's no add-on licenses or services. So, uh, you know, it's available for all, all areas of the Golden Gate technology stack, for NoSQL, for big data, for cloud, for Oracle databases, non-Oracle databases. You've got all of that available in the microservices formats uh, now. You don't have to do a big bang migration. Um, Golden Gate microservices are designed to be backwards compatible with older versions and older architectures of Golden Gate. Uh, so you can begin a phase cutover. You know, once you start that transition, this is gonna be a much more secure uh, infrastructure. The, the Golden Gate microservices have been designed from the ground up to have a highly secure computing environment for cloud operations. You're gonna get better performance, easier upgrades, easier patching, easier uh, administration and lifecycle controls, and it will give you that flexibility to deploy as a mesh, as a hub on the edge or with remote uh, configuration. So it's in your best benefit now, if you're an existing Golden Gate uh, user, to go ahead and move forward with these microservices as soon as you can. Uh, Wells Fargo is a great customer reference for us that discussed their transition to Golden Gate microservices um, at an Oracle Open World event recently. And um, you know some of the benefits that they've uh, been able to talk about are, are around uh, the reduced number of homes. They've moved from thousands of Golden Gate homes. Uh, they've been able to cut those down by more than 50%, in some cases two thirds in certain data centers, while still maintaining equivalent functionality. 
um, as well as uh, applying a much improved high availability and disaster recovery uh, type architecture uh, for their uh, further deployments. And so we think, you know, the just like with Wells Fargo, you know, getting uh, all of our customer base moving over to microservices as quickly as possible will provide a lot of these same uh, these same benefits. So, you know, one of the key things, and this was integral to what Wells Fargo did as well, is beginning to move um, into hub architectures for um, uh, some deployments. And so certain, uh, you know, Golden Gate is pretty unique in the industry here in that you can run it both as a mesh um, as well as a hub. And so for a lot of the distributed architectures, for example, when you go multi-cloud or multi-data center, or if you're doing um, multi-active deployments, there's some benefits um, to running in a mesh type architecture. Uh, but that does complicate uh, the lifecycle maintenance. And so for folks like Wells Fargo that were predominantly running, you know, HA and DR setups within single uh, data centers, uh, hub architecture is uh, can sometimes be ideal, right? Um, because it allows you to simplify the administration and lifecycle management by consolidating um, the different uh, Golden Gate projects onto single compute tiers, um, reducing uh, the, the, the number of storage components. You don't have to distribute uh, for, for the uh, high availability of the transactions at the storage tier. And it allows you to uh, kind of mix and match um, your, uh, your, your Golden Gate deployments for Oracle, non-Oracle, and big data all on a single environment with a single uh, Golden Gate uh, control plane, which would be a, a single service manager across all those deployments. And so uh, you've got the flexibility to run uh, Golden Gate in, in both ways. And that turns out to be you know, a big benefit as you look towards these you know, mesh type architectures, where in some cases your, uh, your superset architecture would be a mesh, but within an individual data center, you may still operate uh, hubs as well. So let's talk about um, microservices for software applications. So within uh, software application design patterns, we've seen a real shift towards uh, these, these service mesh type architectures. And, and this is really kind of the, matures, the, the maturity uh, evolving around uh, what began as kind of just pure microservices. And microservices you know, give you a lot of these key benefits that we've been talking about. You can further decompose the application into discrete components so that it's more modular. Um, you're able to drive greater independence between these individual components that really simplifies uh, the administration, allows you to be more flexible with your, uh, with your deployments and, 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 and you know, really move faster because you're gonna have different teams managing different components of those uh, independent modules. And it gives you that flexibility at scale um, so that you can start small and then uh, scale up over time. And so what we've seen you know, around these microservices architectures is the, the core kind of integral pattern that makes something you know, a microservices or, or part of a service mesh to begin with is this sidecar pattern. I won't get into that um, too much today, but with, with sidecars, it really allows us to manage the individual microservices at scale through this control plane, data plane uh, type architecture. And that's really integral um, to the overall uh, uh, microservices pattern. Now within microservices themselves, as, as a set of solutions, dealing with data has always, you know, from the beginning of the microservices architecture, even going all the way back pre-microservices to service-oriented architecture, dealing with data has always been the hard part, right? Um, so when you begin to manage your data events at the application tier, rather than allowing the data tier uh, to manage the events, then your developers have to tackle a lot of these you know, theoretical and PhD level hard problems that have been solved, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago by the technologies that are uh, driving data tier um, tools, like for example, relational databases. And so all of these issues around the availability and the durability of data, uh, dealing with what's called the CAP theorem around, um, you know, strong consistency and eventual consistency, uh, working with ACID level transaction semantics, where you get uh, you guarantee the atomicity, the consistency, the isolation, and the durability of a transaction, um, not just for databases but also for transaction any transaction processing system. All of these things um, are very very complex problems. Loads of PhD theses is written on these subjects over the last 30 40 years, and now essentially when you begin to adopt 
a pure and sort of dogmatic approach towards microservices, you're asking your application developers to sort of take care of all of these things for you by sort of hand coding them in the in the application tier. So that leads to, you know, ultimately what has been observed as a, a challenge with microservices is it shifts a lot of those hard problems into the hands of the developers. And that's not always the best choice um, around dealing with uh, these data semantics uh, in a very bespoke or custom way. And so what's emerged over the years is a lot of specific design patterns to help developers kind of overcome some of those design challenges. And so dealing with you know, the aggregator pattern, um, the, the database per service pattern to kind of simplify how data resources are persisted per microservice, um, working with uh, specific interaction design patterns like CQRS, I'll mention that in just a minute, command query responsibility segregation, event sourcing, and then um, also transaction outbox. And so these are all different kinds of patterns that are, have been put in place with, you know, you can think of them almost like a recipe where you're, you're, you're guiding a developer towards a specific solution that's been proven time and time again to work, work well. And so for the rest of this presentation, we'll be really double clicking into transaction outbox, event sourcing and um, CQRS and looking at how the Golden Gate microservices frameworks can help further simplify, improve the reliability and the consistency of these specific data patterns for microservices. So uh, let's start with looking at Transaction Outbox. Transaction Outbox is a specific uh, pattern that's been created to help uh, developers when they need to be able to distribute an event um, that a, a microservices has produced and, and publish that event out uh, to other consumers. So you might have other microservices, other application microservices that need to consume events that your microservice is creating. And so Transaction Outbox is uh, really been created to do that. And um, the way that that is done is by taking your core microservice, in this case on the left, we're talking about an order service. And when the inserts are made to persist the data into your local data store, which could be a database, for example, and just tables in a database, to uh, group in that same transaction, that same commit, um, an update to what's called an outbox table. And then uh, from the outbox table, you'd have something, um, which could be a relay, uh, that reads that outbox table and then publishes the event out to a broker. And the broker is where your other consumers would pick it up. And so with Golden Gate, um, we can really simplify this outbox pattern by essentially using Golden Gate as the relay. Um, in the case of Golden Gate, what's really nice about using it as a relay is it's a log reader. So you don't need to pull the outbox table. You, uh, Golden Gate will actually be pushed the event as it shows up in the outbox table because uh, Golden Gate is ch reading the change data events uh, from the underlying data store. And this can be any database, you know, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, um, anything that you happen to be using, AWS, Aurora, et cetera. And so Golden Gate sees those outbox events happening in real time within milliseconds, uh, really, of those events uh, records showing up in the outbox. And then what Golden Gate can do is Golden Gate can go ahead and send those events out to different places. So it could send those events um, into brokers, but it can also send those events directly into other uh, data stores. And so, um, again, you can think of Golden Gate as an exactly once message relay uh, for the transaction outbox. It may, you know, one of the benefits of Golden Gate as a technology here is that it maintains the full transaction consistency of the source updates. Um, this will become useful if you want to use other patterns besides the outbox table. I'll mention that in just a second. Millisecond level latencies, and it has uh, very flexible payloads infrastructure uh, supporting all different types of payload types that, that you might want to uh, uh, that you might want to distribute. So let's look at a couple of different variations of the transaction outbox for Golden Gate. So the baseline pattern, which is what we've just been describing, is to use Golden Gate as that message relay. Um, you know, more often than not, folks may put a JSON payload in the outbox. Golden Gate can pick up that JSON uh, payload and then move it to the message broker. Uh, this is going to be really the typical pattern for uh, microservices. The payloads are the, the data definitions are in the JSON payloads and the JSON payloads uh, go to the message broker. By the way, this could also be Avro, um, you know, into Apache Kafka, for example, where you have schema registries that are, you know, more tightly aligned with with Avro formats as well there. So but that's another uh, variation of it. 
Um, so the another way to do transaction outbox is to just remove the middleman. Um, and so when you eliminate the broker here, you get the benefit of being able to use the relay, in this case, Golden Gate, um, to do a direct insert of the payload into your uh, whatever your targets are. So for example, you can have Golden Gate just send it into a, a REST API directly of a receiving service. Um, you can have Golden Gate just send the data into uh, uh, the JSON payloads into JSON tables of a receiving data store. That could be Cassandra or Mongo or an Oracle database or a Postgres database or whatever directly as JSON types. Or you can actually just send the, the payloads um, to a, a data lake, which uh, a data lake house, which could be an object storage bucket like an S3 bucket, for example. Um, so in this case, you're removing the middleman and you're getting more of a push driven architecture. Um, you're kind of giving up the publish and subscribe framework. Uh, but if you have more of a straight through processing model, or if you don't uh, have multiple consumers that you need to support, uh, this kind of push uh, based approach can be faster and it can be simpler and you don't have to maintain the whole broker infrastructure. So there's some benefits there. A third approach uh, with the transaction outbox is to essentially go directly uh, from the, the DML or the tables rather than using the outbox itself. And so one benefit here is since Golden Gate is reading the logs, it's a, a Golden Gate again is a, is a data event ledger that can read the, uh, the, the data logs of all popular databases. And so rather than creating a separate outbox that you then have to maintain as a developer, and within your microservices schema, um, what you can do is actually just have Golden Gate read the application tables themselves. So if you have a customer table where you're inserting customer events, you can just take those customer events uh, or those order events and push them directly into a downstream target. Um, and so this will give you full fidelity of the uh, application tables. You're going to get, importantly, full consistency. Uh, from the transactions themselves. So if you have an update or an insert that groups um, multiple tables together, your Golden Gate will see those events in the correct order um, and group together with the uh, correct isolation and consistency. So the, the binding in this case of the data shape becomes the shape of the tables rather than the shape of the JSON payloads. And so in both cases, your developers will kind of create a schema and a shape. And in one case, it's a, it's a JSON schema or an Avro schema and the, the, the payload is the, the binding. In the other case, um, it would actually be the tables themselves. Um, and on the output side, if you wanted to maintain that JSON uh, schema or JSON shape, you can still have Golden Gate map uh, the internal uh, ledger formats to an output payload, which can be JSON or Avro or some other file type um, into a downstream target. And so that's still a possibility within the Golden Gate tool to do the formatting uh, the document formatting and then output as a document. And then the fourth variation that we'll look at here is uh, uh, taking uh, the same transaction outbox concept, uh, but instead of reading from the base tables of the microservice, creating some view tables. And so this is very similar in concept to using an outbox table with JSON payloads, but in this case, you craft the shape of your view tables to be materialized views that take um, the shape of the records that you want to see as aggregates. And so this has been commonly used in the industry for a long, long time. We usually talk about these as quote unquote interface tables. Um, and just as I mentioned before, the bindings that your data consumers would have here would be on the shape of the view tables. And this is important to understand is that no matter how you distribute data from your microservice, whether it's as a JSON payload, um, as the base tables of the microservice or as view tables from the microservice, your downstream consumers, wherever they're picking the data up from, from a broker or whether it's a direct push model from Golden Gate, they have to understand those bindings. The shape, the schema of the data is something that they're going to have to be able to understand and, and decode on, on their side. And in, in this case, um, this example, the transaction outbox is, is really being uh, uh, put forward from the materialized views themselves. So, so this transaction outbox stuff is pretty cool, right? I mean, what you can do is with those four variations we just discussed and with support from Golden Gate, from you know, all of these different thousands of different combinations of data stores and technologies, what that really means is you can set up a transaction outbox pattern for your whole enterprise. Now imagine that at scale across all your data centers, all your clouds, all your edge compute um, devices, being able to have this continuous flow 
of real-time transactions, real-time payloads, real-time data events distributed across that entire ecosystem. So this is really, um, to use the technical lingo that we've been talking about, this is a microservices based transaction outbox for the entire enterprise platform across multiple clouds. Um, and that's that's a pretty cool, you know, big idea to think about all of that real-time data flowing around at scale. So uh, this leads us to other variations of these microservices patterns like event sourcing. Event sourcing is a big, big topic in the microservices community. Um, as a pattern, it has a lot of different um, uses and use cases uh, for microservices. For some folks, uh, they really are trying to leverage event sourcing as an alternative, in some cases, as an alternative dur uh, durable data store uh, rather than using databases. Um, and it, it can also be used as a way to kind of sequence events or to distribute events that are sequenced in order. Um, there's different implementations out here. A lot of folks are essentially going down the path of tying these event sourcing patterns in with you know, popular open source frameworks like Apache Kafka and Apache Pulsar. You can also use event sourcing with um, message queuing tools like RabbitMQ. I've seen folks um, uh, design event sourcing patterns around uh, NoSQL engines uh, like, uh, like Cassandra. Uh, for example, um, or, uh, you know, and, and you know, from a, a DIY perspective, there's also purpose-built event store engines that really, hard, you know, I don't say hard code, but they implement the event sourcing pattern directly into the model. And, um, you know, so, so these purpose-built stores like Eventuate or Aqua or Event Store, they're out there as well. But when you look at the, the four different areas on the right where uh, these event sourcing patterns can be applied, they're all different in some pretty meaningful ways. You know, for some folks, they really see this as being an alternative to the database. And so if you have a highly durable um, event uh, ledger, like let's say Apache Kafka, um, where you can get you know very high levels of durability on your, on your data and your data can be stored for a very long, long time as events, you know, um, you know, uh, weeks, months, or even years, um, that, that can be an alternative. There's trade-offs with that, but that's certainly, as a, as a durable store option, that's one option that people are doing. Uh, other folks, you know, kind of really continue to rely on the relational uh, engines uh, for the durability of the data underneath their uh, microservices, and there's, a, there's still a lot of benefits for databases versus tools like Kafka from a durability standpoint and a recoverability standpoint. But the event stores in those models can also be used as really a communication scratch pad where the events get pushed out to the event store almost as a fan out architecture where other microservices are consuming uh, from, the, from the event store itself. Uh, there's also this other dimension where you know event stores are used predominantly for local events um, within a specific uh, what's called bounded context or a data domain for a group of services that are working together very closely. Um, there's also the notion of using the event store for uh, shared events where it can be more broadly applied to a group of domains, a group of context and services are kind of communicating payloads as events that might be consumed um, by many others, you know, potentially by consumers that they didn't even envision. Um, and so in those cases, the bind data bindings are uh, more loose. And so there's over the years, there's been a lot of critiques of the event sourcing model. And I think, in my opinion, that arises somewhat because it's such a flexible model. It's been used for a lot of different things. Um, for a lot of folks, um, this is really a bad architecture because it exposes the persistence tier when you're when you're essentially using it as a way to publish your payloads, those those JSON payloads. Um, are, are optimized for your local microservice, not for sharing. Um, and so one critique is, is, well, hey, you know, you're, you're exposing the schema or the semantics of your internal formats rather than something that's designed to be shared. Another uh, critique is what's called the whole system fallacy, where um, when you begin to use the event sourcing model for lots of microservices that are coming from different application contexts and different data domains, um, you can uh, pretty easily begin to lose the meaning of those payloads where terms get overloaded. For example, you have you know, multiple microservices, multiple applications, multiple contexts, all dealing with customers. But the definition of a customer, the meaning of a customer entity uh, can be different across the whole system. And so you wind up with mismatch semantics and it becomes challenging for people to kind of interpret 
what the different data definitions mean, even though they're all flowing through the same event engine. Um, and the, the final thing here is that it really, when you go with an event sourcing model purely on a broker, um, it really forces the developers to manage eventual consistency themselves. Um, and that becomes a huge challenge because there's, you know, the t tools like uh, uh, brokers, uh, uh, tools like Apache Kafka or these event sourcing engines, they're not databases. I mean, that sounds self-evident to say this, but the, uh, Kafka is not a database. And what that means is you don't get the full uh, transactional consistency of ACID transactions. And so when you don't get ACID level semantics, you're really uh, uh, enforcing the, uh, the developers of those services to take eventual consistency as a given. And if you kind of go into that knowing that that's what you're going to do, that can be okay. There's been you know, loads of case studies showing that you can have an eventual consistency model work fine in microservices architectures, but it does require you know, higher order thinking and, and introduces greater complexity in the applications tier. Um, so, you know, all of these different factions of the microservices community have different ideas, opinions about how much those event sourcing patterns should be used. And that's useful to keep in mind is that there's no kind of one best way. Um, you know, when we think about moving from event sourcing uh, as a standard microservices architecture pattern and then adopting or applying it with Transaction Outbox, we can simplify this greatly uh, by really introducing Transaction Outbox with tools like Apache, uh, Apache Kafka and Oracle Golden Gate as a combined approach uh, for the event sourcing model. We can use it for shared events or communications. You can delegate the data tier consistency uh, constraints to uh, Golden Gate as a technology, but then still get the benefits of using Apache Kafka as the broker. And you know when you, um, when you apply this at scale, you can really use this in a system-wide context to successfully support a fan-out type architecture. And that will leverage the registries and the data catalogs that are built into the technologies like uh, uh, Oracle Golden Gate and Apache Kafka. So one customer that's done this successfully uh, has been uh, PayPal. And this has probably been a service that many of you have already used. But within PayPal, they have um, this notion of synchronous microservices over here on the, the left. And this is where your payments get processed. So if you um, send a payment or accept a payment, these are all synchronous services dealing with money. Uh, but then you have your mobile apps where you get an activity stream where you can see that historic activity and that's a different microservice. And so you've got kind of two different, I'm simplifying, there's actually more there, but th let's just say at a high level, two different uh, groups of microservices. One deals with the synchronous payment events, the other deals with the asynchronous um, mobile activity streams. You know, when um, PayPal looked at doing this, they uh, knew that the solution had to work very fast. It had to work at scale across, you know, many data centers globally with, you know, billions of transactions uh, happening, um, uh, you know, all the time through this. Um, so it, it needed to be a true event-driven real-time architecture. They looked at a couple of different ways to solve this. They looked at um, supporting what are called multi-phase commits. Uh, multi-phase commits would uh, potentially use a broker technology and apply those commits in a sequence uh, controlled through uh, the synchronous uh, microservice on the left, the actual payments engine. But when you go this approach, you're essentially giving up the availability uh, uh, portion of the CAP theorem in, in order to achieve consistency. And what that means is if you get a failure on any one of the two commits, the whole transaction fails. And so what you can't do is you can't put the availability SLA of the activity stream in line with the availability SLA service level agreements of the payments platform. So that wasn't going to work. The second thing that they looked at was kind of the pure event sourcing model with uh, just using a tool like Apache Kafka by itself. Um, in this case, you run head on into the transactional consistency issues of, of not getting ACID properties. In your, in your data store. And so this is um, essentially what's called uh, the read your write consistency problems where the, the readers can get out of position um, and then you have uh, different results um, happening if uh, both sets of uh, 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 readers are, are coming off of the same log and that log has different uh, kinds of availability uh, requirements as well. 
So what they ended up going with is an approach, essentially uh, applying the transaction outbox pattern in the event sourcing model, just as we discussed in the previous chart. And so what this does is it allows um, the uh, synchronous system to interact with its local data store in a fully ACID compliant, uh, highly consistent way. And then what we do is we move those events uh, directly uh, using the technology, in this case Oracle Golden Gate, uh, to the activity stream uh, engine. And so what that does is that gives you 100% correctness guarantees, 0% data loss or corruption. Um, you get very low latency, uh, many cases down to single digit seconds. Um, and you get uh, strong guarantees around availability. So this is exactly where we're talking about getting those correctness guarantees, the trusted data mesh uh, guarantees, joining the systems of record with the systems of analysis. And um, in this case, the architecture can scale out very wide, dealing with you know multiple terabytes uh, per day consistently uh, since 2018 and still going. And so uh, this is a, a very, um, good example of building out that trusted architecture where we're still working with microservices, but we're um, emphasizing trusted events uh, at scale. And by the way, also simplifying uh, the architecture itself so that the uh, management of uh, the data consistency isn't pushed into the application tier. And so in a lot of ways, what we just saw there from the PayPal example is the implementation of what they were going for, which was a, a, a command query responsibility segregation. That's a mouthful, but it's, uh, let's just say CQRS pattern. And uh, for their uh, purposes, the, um, the, uh, the main application for them over here on the left was their payments platform. So you can think of this as the debits and credits, the sending and receiving of money, uh, the transactions uh, for, for taking those money events. Um, uh, and, and that really was the payment side of their microservices. But then on the con, uh, for their customers, they want to see an activity stream of what's been going on with the payments, but the activity stream could also include you know, user activities, promotions, other things kind of going on within their account. And that really is this activity history microservice. And so again, rather than in their case, trying to write everything themselves through a multi-phase commit architecture or through um, the event sourcing model where they wrote their, would have had to write their own event handlers in the microservices tier, uh, that creates all the problems that we mentioned before around complexity, uh, the bespoke interfaces, the bespoke uh, handlers, and then on top of all of that, not getting the strong consistency guarantees. What they ended up going with here is really a CQRS pattern with Transaction Outbox and Oracle Golden Gate. And so the logical replication uh, moves the transaction events with um, full consistency, millisecond level updates um, from uh, one set of microservices to another set of microservices. And this happens in combination. And again, Golden Gate itself is a microservice. So, um, you know, even though we, we do have um, a binding here that's happening between uh, the payloads, even if we would have done that uh, between the, the top level microservices, the binding would have been JSON payloads, for example. So we still have bindings that happen at the payload level. But with this solution pattern, we essentially have at a high level abstraction, three microservices. We've got the main order service, we've got the order history microservice, and then we've got the Golden Gate microservice. And between the three of these, we're able to get those highly consistent, very low latency uh, transactions moving uh, continuously uh, uh, between these microservices. So it's a much simpler and much more trusted and trustworthy solution for dealing with um, these patterns. And so again, you know, in the, the CQRS pattern, uh, the event store is the, the way that the messages are distributed. The bindings happen between the payloads, typically JSON or Avro payloads that flow through the event store. And then you have to write handlers uh, to deal with those payloads on um, the order history side uh, or the, the history side of the CQRS model. So this is really, um, you know, worse latency, it's more code to maintain, there's more impedance, and you also have more risk around data getting out of sync than if you just go with this transaction outbox approach with CQRS. And so with the transaction outbox, we're essentially bringing in Oracle Golden Gate as the means to move um, the data events from the individual uh, durable stores for each of the, the, the application microservices. And then we move those transactions into uh, the history or the activity 
microservice. This gives you better consistency and recoverability. Uh, it's less code to write and maintain for the developers, and you get the best possible performance, the lowest latency on transactions. So, you know, really what's not to love about that solution. All right, so there's a lot more we didn't get a chance to go into with uh, Oracle Golden Gate, you know, the different topologies we support for real-time databases, non-relational events for cloud and NoSQL, uh, data lakes and data lake houses and SaaS replication, and then, you know, event processing and analytics for streaming environments, time series analysis, geofencing, uh, injecting machine learning uh, algorithms as part of your data preparation and data transformation flows. Loads of great stuff we could talk about for Golden Gate. Those are different sessions for a different day. Wanted to make sure everybody knew that we have all that content available for you. You know, for final thoughts, you know, really what we wanted to convey is that, you know, with uh, Oracle Golden Gate, you get an easy to use, no code, fully microservices based user experience. You can create these real interesting uh, microservices solutions that we've been talking about for uh, this entire presentation. Uh, Golden Gate uh, can, can give you that uh, easy to use browser-based interface to get those microservices patterns uh, put in place. Works well for uh, developers, data engineers, uh, database uh, administrators, uh, as well as end users that are just simply interested in subscribing to and pulling change data off of these replication services. So give it a shot, check it out. Uh, latest version is actually 21.3. Um, we have free workshops available in the cloud uh, to give this a try. Uh, you can also pull Golden Gate down uh, from uh, Docker registry and give it a try that way as well. So. Uh, with that, you know, thank you very much uh, for listening in. It's been a, a long session. I hope you learned a few things here. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Pollock, Vice President of Products for Oracle. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and your attention today. Take care and have a good one.